exclusive interview with former Northeast Wrestling Champion Matt Steven. I believe he is on the line. Are you there, Matt? I am. Hello? Hey, Welcome Matt. How's it going? Good, good. How are you guys? Doing, doing great. great. Doing great. Yeah, so, um, Graham, why don't you give our listeners uh, some uh, information about our guests, and we'll go into the interview. Well, this is Matt Taven, as I just said, former Northeast Wrestling Champion of the of the organization. He was one of the longest reigning Northeast champ, Northeast Wrestling Champions in recent history. Just recently turning heel at one of the Northeast Wrestling shows, continuously delivering show stealing appearances. Show, I'm sorry, show stealing appearances, performances every single show that I go to. I've been a life, I've been a uh, Northeast Wrestling fan for the past couple of years now. It's great to have you on the show, Matt. How are you doing today? Oh. Thank you. I appreciate it. I pre- appreciate the kind words, too. No problem. No problem. We just want to get an exclusive interview today because there's a lot of people out there that want to know the inside scoop of being a pro wrestler. And I know uh, from your matches over the last couple of years that you definitely have the experience of a pro wrestler. And my first question to you, before we get into anything else about the inside of the ring, I just want to get your life outside of the ring and how you became a pro wrestler and what your aspirations were for becoming a pro wrestler. Oh, wow. Um, well, I'm originally from New Hampshire. Um, grew up there, went to high school there. You know, in high school, played um, football and basketball. Went to college, played my freshman year of basketball there, and uh, <laughs> the program, the D3 program, it was very lackluster, so I uh, decided to focus somewhere else and actually focus on the books. But um, after I graduated from school, was uh, where I really got into the actual thought of becoming a wrestler. See, I'd, I'd been a fan since probably the age of six and um, loved wrestling my entire life, but never you know, never thought of it more than like a, a pipe dream of, uh, yeah, I would love to be a wrestler, but never, never really thought of pursuing it. Um, after college, I actually worked for the New England Patriots, and um, while I was with the Patriots, a friend of mine, um, happened to be uh, training and, and wrestling on the indie circuit and just asked me to come down one time before a show. Just to, You know, he knew I loved wrestling and um, told me to get, just get in the ring and try it out, see how I liked it, and uh, I was hooked. And uh, after that, I was um, paired up with Spike Dudley there, who trained me at the lockup school down in Fall River, Massachusetts. Very nice, very nice. You didn't train, however, you just said that you trained in Massachusetts. You didn't have any training in the school in New Haven, did you? Because we, we had a bull dread on the show a couple of weeks ago, and that's where he said he trained. You didn't have any connection with that school, did you? No, 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 no. My training, um, when, uh, when I first started, was just with Spike Dudley and then uh, with Bob Evans after that and um, Mike Bennett, who's uh, the prodigy Mike Bennett now of Ring of Honor. Oh, yep, yep. I saw you guys wrestle the show a couple weeks ago. That was an awesome match. And uh, another thing I wanted to ask you, um, back in April, on the final edition of WWE Tough Enough, you were shown on television with Luke Robinson. Uh, what's the connection between you and Luke Robinson? Um, me and Luke, uh, we go way back. We're actually really, really good friends. Uh, one of my closest friends in the business of uh, professional wrestling, for sure. Um, me and Luke met uh as as i as i did uh, a couple of indie de- uh, dates up in maine um for uh, the nwa promotion uh up in maine um luke was working for the promotion at the same time and we just have a very common personality and very common traits with one another and have the same sense of humor and, and kind of hit it off and stayed very close friends um up until you know still to this day but um what happened with the tough enough thing was they were filming, you know, obviously the the parts of when they come back to their hometown, and, and Luke asked me to come up and and do some of the in ring stuff with with him. We're, we're very familiar with each other with each other. We've wrestled each other a million times, so he wanted to be in there with someone he was uh, comfortable with, and um, asked me to come up. And they happened to use they happened to use me talking on TV, which was shocking because. Um, Actually, that clip that they aired, they didn't tell us that they were filming at the time. So they just told us they were practice. They were trying to get the lighting right for the cameras. So I was very surprised to see that uh, I had a speaking part on, on the finale. Yeah, I know. That was pretty sick. I was watching the finale, and I saw you in the shot, and I was like, wait a second. Is that Matt Taven? 
and you tweeted about it, and I thought that was pretty cool. But um, on the subject of Luke Robinson, I just recently saw you and Luke at the same show back in December. Did you guys have any sort of, you know, reuniting at the NEW shows? Because I know they're, I know that he comes to those shows a lot more frequently now. Oh, well, me and Luke, we talk, uh, like, on a weekly basis. And, you know, I, I go up to visit him or he comes down to Boston just, just to hang out with one another. So we, we've been seeing each other, you know, We've seen each other a bunch. Um, when we get to do a show with one another, it's fun because we actually get to travel together. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, we kind of see each other all the time. So us being on the same show is just, you know, happenstance. Yeah, and also on um, Northeast Wrestling, too, besides Luke Robinson, they have all they have a whole bunch of stars come in every single show, people like Tommy Dreamer. Um, they have a whole bunch of legends come in for almost every show to attract fans, and it definitely gets me attracted to the uh, to the product every show that you guys put on. And as I just said, Tommy Dreamer, you appeared on his YouTube show a couple <laughs> weeks ago, and I thought that was pretty funny too. And why he had you on the show was because he was doing a segment, Voice of the Voiceless, and he compared you to Johnny, I believe, I think he said Johnny, of the Spirit Squad. Now, have a lot of people resembled you to Johnny of the Spirit Squad from <laughs> WWE or no? Was it just Tommy? No, that's actually a very common thing. I mean, people might not understand um, the connection because of, you know, the long hair and stuff that I have. And, and when when Johnny was on TV there, he, they cut his hair. But Johnny Jeter used to have uh, long hair like mine as well. And uh, even when I pull my hair back, like a lot of people say I look exactly like him. Actually, the first time I ever met Jim Cornette, he, he went off on a tangent. Oh, God. Actually, I can't repeat what he said now that I think of it, but he's like, you look just like Don <laughs> Peter. Um, so, I mean, I get that all the time. I've got him from every end of the spectrum. So uh, <laughs> it was funny to actually, you know, use it and, and, and make a little joke out of it on Tommy's show for once. Yeah, no, I thought that was pretty funny. And uh, Now, speaking of Tommy Dreamer, you've had the honor of wrestling a lot of those guys that come through NEW. And who's been your favorite opponent? I'm sorry, opponent to work with while in Northeast Wrestling. More, you can say anybody. It could be anyone from the uh, local area, anyone like Bull Dredd or on Zombie. But uh, mm. anyone, well, just first of all, just claim who your favorite opponent was that's more famous that was in WWE or TNA, legend wise, AWA, NWA, whatever. Well, I would have to say, uh, you know, someone that I had a lot of chemistry with, and and probably because we have a similar quick style, was Paul London. Uh, we had the chance to wrestle in a, in a couple of uh, multi-person matches, and when we're in the ring together, it's just, it, it, I mean, it's just so smooth. He's phenomenal, and uh, he makes me look so good. So, I mean, it was just a pleasure to be in the same ring as him, but the uh, chemistry we have was great. Um Besides him, uh, a person that, you know, was assigned to, to WWE at one point, but actually is signed to Ring of Honor at the moment, um, me and Mike Bennett's matches, I, I can't say enough about. They're always probably, you know, in my top five, top three matches. Every single one that we have just seems to be better than the one before. Um, and I really, really, really enjoy uh, wrestling him. Uh, we, we've been able to do it pretty much since when I first really started. So to see the progression of how much better they get, uh, just you know, put puts another feather in my cap and makes me feel really proud about what we've we've done together. Yeah, and Mike Bennett currently works for ROH, doesn't he? I believe he still yep. works there, correct? Yeah. yeah. Have yes, you ever thought does. about working for Ring of Honor? Or? I actually uh, was just down there at their previous. At their last TV taping, I made my TV debut for Ring of Honor. So, oh, really? I worked for Ring. Oh, okay. yeah, so down in Baltimore. I've, I've worked for Ring of Honor uh, numerous occasions. I've been on a couple of their DVDs, and I've actually been doing dark matches um, for them starting in, in 2009. Um, but I'm hoping that you know, after this this last debut that I just made on TV, that it's it's the start of something uh, good, and I can uh, continue from there. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. A lot of the people from ROH obviously end up in WWE or TNA, so do you think that making it into ROH could take you to the next step of WWE or TNA, like a lot of the guys like Daniel Bryan, otherwise known as Brian Danielson, Samoa mm -hmm. Joe, um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, what was that yeah, name, Paul. that guy, the, uh, <laughs> the guy from TNA, the, the guy that made his debut beating Kurt Angle, he came down with a sickness. 
I can't think of his name right now. (laughs) Yeah, I can't think of it right now, but um, CM Punk obviously would be another primary example. So, yeah, as I just said, would would be getting into Ring of Honor take you to the next step of going to WWE or TNA, someone like a mainstream organization? Well, I think uh, every wrestler's goal is to, you know, make it to the Super Bowl of wrestling, which is WrestleMania. I mean, if that's not your ultimate goal, I'm not really sure why you are in wrestling. Um, If you don't want to be the best at what you're doing, uh, you might want to do something else. But, like you said, you know, a lot of guys have gone to the WWE that way, and if I can be another one of those guys, then then that that would just be a, a blessing because... My ultimate goal is to be at WrestleMania, is to walk through the curtain, you know, on the biggest stage. Um, and whatever it takes to get there, whether it be, you know, making my name elsewhere, which I have been, you know, that's, that's, that's what it's going to take. Um, I would love to be a Ring of Honor. I love their product. I, I The guys that are in their locker room, their rosters, unbelievable, phenomenal. I mean, I, sometimes I just watch those guys. I can't even believe you know, the show that they're putting on. So to to be grouped in with them is is a blessing and to one day make it to the to the grandest stage is my is my ultimate goal. Yeah, ROH Ring of Honor is most definitely more or uh, oriental based in wrestling, whereas WWE is more on the storyline than it is the wrestling. Well they're getting back to wrestling part of it, but they're more oriented on the wrestling and the storylines combined. Now, a lot of the guys who have walked into WWE, someone like Daniel Bryan, and Brian Danielson, Brian Danielson, I should say, have the fear of the backseat politics, which have got them fired in the past from WWE. Now, I know, as you said, it's every wrestler's dream to work for the WWE, but if, it, if they were forcing you to do a gimmick or something stupid, you know, against your will, something really stupid, which they have done in the past, take a look, uh, good look at Cole Cabana, who had to go through that, Scotty Goldman gimmick when he was in mm. WWE. He was a glorified jobber, unfortunately. He had a lot of wasted potential in WWE. They just did not use him right. Would you like to go to WWE if they had to do that with you, or would you just, you know, just with the thought of being there in WWE, or would you turn down an offer of the WWE if they made you do something like that? Well, uh, you know, honestly, that's, that's more of a... A situation I'd have to, to, or a decision I'd have to make when I was there. But to be honest with you, and this is, you know, I, I have no experience in the situation because I, I haven't had that opportunity yet. But you, you got to take what's given to you and try to run with it. I mean, look at Zack Ryder. You know, he was floundering, and and after they broke up the tag team, he was kind of, he was trying to do the Jersey Shore type type gimmick and, and kind of didn't know where he fit in and, and on his own got himself to where he is today. I mean, I think there's a way to to make yourself shine in any situation. So I just kind of would take uh, whatever was given to me and, and turn it into the best thing that I could do with it personally. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. They They most definitely – change your direction when you get into WWE just to shape you into what they want you to be other than mm-hmm. what you naturally are. Seeing that they tried to do that with Brian Danielson and they kind of switched him up a little bit, you know, angers a lot of people. But some people turn out all right, especially in TNA, someone like Samoa Joe, who was a monster in Ring of Honor and who ended up being a monster in TNA. Now, Rob Echoes, otherwise known as Robbie E. in TNA, got a TNA contract in the summer of 2010, I believe, would you like to follow in his footsteps because he was obviously from Northeast Wrestling too? And just a couple of years ago, when I started attending these Northeast Wrestling shows, I saw I saw him wrestling. My first Northeast Wrestling match that I witnessed was um, Robbie Echoes, the Platinum Papa versus Frankie Aaron. And now well, he's turned that. Was into that the TNA. Yes, yeah, yeah, it was in uh, in May, I believe, in 2009, I think. But um, hmm. yeah, now he's Robbie E in TNA as a TNA Television Champion. So, do you think if you were offered a contract in TNA, would you definitely still take that up? I mean, obviously, it's not WWE, but it's another mainstream organization where you can definitely no, get your name out there. And exactly. I mean, and, and you just said it, you know, get your name out there. Everything's exposure. Everything is another step up the ladder to your ultimate goal. Um, 
Rob is an awesome, awesome, awesome guy. I cannot say enough good things about him. He really, I mean, worked his way up there, and, and he deserves everything that is happening for him. Now he's a television champion, but if you watch that show and watch the stuff that Robbie's in, I mean, he's the one coming up with all those you know, one-liners, and that's all his facials and the way he delivers lines. I mean, he's the one that's making that happen. Not anyone can just go in there and, and get a spot and, be, be you know, make something of it. I, and even even Robbie, you know, he had him and and uh, Becky, or, or Cookie, I should say, down there. And, um, you know, it worked out a little bit, but I don't think it worked out to his ultimate goal. And, and you know, he changed things up. And, and look at him now. Now he's a television champion, and uh, he's on a roll. I mean, you got to give it up to the guy. And if I could do the same thing, you know, that that would be great. I would I would love to, to follow in those same, same footsteps. Yeah, most definitely. It's all about, in the end, it's all about how you get yourself over. Because as you just said, as a primary example, it's it was Zack Ryder who got himself over with the crowd, and now he, he was United States champion, I should say. And Robbie, he, he got himself over with that gimmick. He became X Division champion rather quickly. He became TNA television champion. He gets pretty good heat in TNA Impact. So he's definitely rising up the ladder in TNA. You have Zack Ryder. And as I just said, you have to get yourself over in the organization Obviously, if the corporation's holding you down, because that's exactly what they did with Zack Ryder. He wasn't given any chances, and you have to earn it in uh, pro wrestling if you ever want to get anywhere. And now back on the subject that you just mentioned, Cookie, Robbie E's ballet. Now, I saw that at your most recent match that I saw, in, um, not in Waterbury, uh, Terryville, last month. You had a new valet with you. Um, I think that was the first time, the first match that you had her with you. Are you going to explore that gimmick down the road, or is that was that just a one-night thing when you had someone with you as a manager? Oh, no, no, no. That's, uh, that, that's the shtick now. That's, uh, she'll be with me from, from here on out. Um, her name's Casey Ray. Uh, she's a student of Chaotic Wrestling up in Massachusetts, and she is... Yeah, great counterparts to me. I think we work really well with uh, with one another. Um, I think it just adds that much more dimension to my character, especially in NEW, where people have seen me for so long and they've they've seen me wrestle everyone. Well, uh, now this is something fresh and something different that they haven't seen before, and uh, a kind of a turn in the page for Matt Taven. Yeah, exactly. A lot of managers have that valet or that specific manager that helps him get extra heat as a heel, because I know you just recently turned heel, but it was more of a slow transition kind of thing. It wasn't like Bull Dread a couple years ago, because I know at one show, Bull Dread turned heel on Ron Zombie by just hitting him in the back with a chair, whereas your t- heel turn, you're still, yeah, you're a heel, right? I mean, just to clarify that. Well, I'm a pretty bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> then it was, it was more of a slow transition, so I'm not 100% sure because unlike Bull Dread, I liked your heel turn a lot more personally. Don't tell him I said that. He'll kill me. But uh, I liked your heel turn a lot more because it was more of a slow transition to it. into it. It was more like how Christian and Daniel Bryan are kind of at the moment, how they were kind of – your character was more over with the championship, how he was more obsessed with the championship and once he – lost it, you know, he became more of a bad guy and obsessed with taking the championship back. And that was a, a that was an awesome match that you had with um Brian Anthony back in Waterbury a couple months ago over the NEW title at Steel Cage. That was awesome. That was so sick. You guys definitely have that chemistry inside the ring. And yeah, back to that point, you were the longest reigning Northeast wrestling champion, I believe, in recent history. Now what is what does it feel like to have that championship? Because I believe you had it from January, I think, of 2010 to last September. So that was about, I don't know, about 20 months, I believe, almost over a year and a yeah, half. Yeah, it was, a, it was so, a pretty long time with it, almost two years. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, was, it, was, it was great. I mean, at, at first, um, it was almost, I, I was a you know, young kid, and I, I just kind of got into it. Or, I mean, I've been in Northeast wrestling for a little bit, but I, I didn't see... Uh, myself rising up so quickly, even though I wanted it to happen, it was still kind of a, a shock when it did. Um, 
And then after that, uh, you know, like you said, uh, I I started off a fan favorite there, and and uh, slowly the fans, you know, they they're they're fickle those wrestling fans, and they they I think they might have got sick of my act and uh, might have started turning on me before I really turned on them. Um, I was hearing more and more blues, especially in Connecticut when you're facing Brian Anthony. He's from Connecticut, and, you know, they started getting behind him. And, and, and to be honest, it was, um, you know, it was a very natural turn because, in, in my mind, every single Northeast show, I give 110%. I'm diving out of the ring. I'm, you know, going up top, just abusing my body. And to hear blues from anyone uh, is almost infuriating because uh, it just is a complete lack of appreciation of the things that I've that I've done, and uh, you know Connecticut and Waterbury, they they were behind Brian Anthony, so I let them know how I feel, and uh, that's that's kind of how I feel about the Northeast Wrestling fan base at this point. Exactly, that typically tends to happen to a lot of baby faces that you know they have that strong baby face gimmick going with them for a little while. Then after you continuously do the same thing, they start to get sick of it, and then they turn on you, as you just said, before you turn on them. Then you start embracing the booze. That's when it gets really strong reactions. And I believe I saw one of your promos that Northeast Wrestling put on YouTube a couple months ago. And the more you slowly transition into that role of a heel, that's when you start to become one of the most over heels in the entire business. Like, I know that you're one of the top heels of Northeast Wrestling at the moment. There's both Red and there's a few others. But it's interesting that you just said that a lot of the baby faces get booed before you start embracing it. And one of those guys that strikes me like that is Lucas Sharp. You know, Mr. 305 or something like that. I, no, 203. I'm not sure. I don't really know my Connecticut area code that well. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, never mind then. It was some other guy. He's some guy that does that same kind of oh, gimmick. Oh, too, no, when I he kinda... know Lucas. I know Lucas. I just, I'm not sure if it's a 203 or the 3 whatever, but... No, Lucas is, um, you know, he's a great athlete. I've, I've been able to see him uh, at top world promotions up in Massachusetts a lot and then other times when I've been in Connecticut. And, uh, you know, he's a great kid, a great athlete, and, you know, just keeps working hard. And, and there's only one thing that, that's going to happen to people that work really hard, and that's that's good things. Yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. In the end, it's all going to pay off. So eventually he hopes – to get in the championship picture, much like you did. Hopefully, wait, have, you guys haven't worked together yet, have you? Um, I have never wrestled Lucas. I'm not sure. I know I've never had it at Northeast Wrestling. I'm not sure if I have. Oh, well, I worked um, that show in December. I uh, wrestled him in a, a triple threat match with uh, Mikazi as well in uh, Bethel, Connecticut. Bethany, Connecticut, or Bethel, I'm not sure. Oh, okay, okay. And um, another topic that I wanted to hit was on Tommy Dreamer's TV show, which I thought was hilarious because I was one of the only ones watching that show. Was Obviously, that was a Northeast Wrestling fan because a lot of the people watching that show probably weren't familiar with your work and weren't from the Northeast Wrestling era area, I should say. And uh, they showed, Tommy Dreamer showed the footage of you performing the backflip at George on George the Animal Steel back in October a couple of years ago. Yeah. That was I was marking that when I saw that because I was at that show when that happened. So and I believe you were still a, you were still a baby face at the time. So what was what was all up with that? Was that on purpose or was that an accident and he moved? Whatever happened to that? Well, you know, it's a it's a moment in time that uh, seems to be following me wherever I go. Um, but in reality, I, I I never meant to um, move to do the moonsault. I was a George Seal. Uh, it was aimed for Bull Dread, and George just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time and and walked right in front of it. And unfortunately, I got him instead of my desired target. And, uh, you know, that's that's just the kind of thing that happens. You know, we're out there going 100 miles an hour and, and uh, you know, doing pretty risky stuff. And, you know, you aim for one thing and another thing happens. But, uh, you know, George is a great guy, and I was able to talk to him afterwards. I actually was able to hang out with him for the rest of the weekend and really pick his brain. And, they, you know, he's seen so much and has so much knowledge of the of wrestling 
that it, it was a great experience in the end for me just because it got me so close to George and, uh, you know, we exchanged numbers and I'd call him from time to time and just see how everything was going, how he's been. Um, and he's just living the life. He lives down in Key West and seems to have not a, a worry in the world. And uh, I'm very envious of what he's been able to do with his career, have longevity, save his money, and now it's just living, living the easy life. Exactly. One of the most important factors of that that whole incident was the fact that you guys kept on going, and that's one of the most important factors of any WWE, not, I'm sorry, not WWE match, pro wrestling match, is that you just keep on going no matter what happens. If there's a botch or anything along those lines, you just keep on going. And uh, on the subject of George the Animal Steel, he is obviously a WWE Hall of Famer. And I didn't ask you this before when you were talking about when you were growing up and uh, watching your wrestling since six. Um, who was your WWE, not WWE at all, just overall, who was your idol growing up in pro wrestling? Well, I mean, when I was very young and I was first getting into it, you know, I didn't really obviously understand wrestling as much as I do today. So the kind of the colors and the lights and the glitz and glam was the one that struck me. So as like a five-year-old kid, I was ripping my Hulk Hogan T-shirt and, and uh, tying my shoelaces around my arm to be the ultimate warrior. But as I started to, you know, get older and even at the age of like seven and eight and uh, I, you know, got more knowledge or, or had just been watching long enough that um, I started to appreciate everything about wrestling. Uh, Bret Van Van Hart, you know, when he was the champion, when he was the Intercontinental Champion especially, I can just remember I was running around the house and, and begging my mom for the little plastic Intercontinental belt and telling her I was Bret the Hitman Hart and <laughs> finding any pair of sunglasses I could or, or a jacket that looked like his and walking around the house just uh, trying to be the Hitman. Uh, still to this day, he is a inspiration of mine. I mean, one of the reasons why I've gotten in this business and, and I've had the opportunity through Northeast Wrestling uh, to talk to him and, and to be on shows with him and, and to pick his brain as well. And it's like, uh, it's like, you know, growing up a basketball fan your whole life and, and all of a sudden you get to meet Michael Jordan and, and ask him how you can be a better, you know, basketball player. Or all of a sudden you get to meet, you know, Larry Bird. And it's, it's one of those things that uh, I've met Brett, a handful of times now and, you know, to a point where, um, you know, it's not like well, a weird conversation anymore. He, you know, we, we just, you know, hi and we know each other and we catch up on from the last time we've seen each other. And it's, but it's something to me that I never get comfortable or like, uh, okay with. So in my mind, I'm like, Oh my God, I'm talking to Brett the Hitman Hart. You know, this is a guy that was the reason why I got into this whole thing. So, um, if I had to pick one person, it would have to be him. Now, if you had a dream match against any WWE legend, NWA legend, any legend whatsoever, alive or not, who would it be if they were still in their prime, that is? Um, geez, that's a tough one. I mean, I'd have to put Brett in there, but since I just talked about him for 15 minutes, uh, you know, I also have to throw in the other person that was a big influence to me, Shawn Michaels. Uh, and, geez, that's, that's a good question. I mean, Chris Jericho, Brian Pillman. There's, the list goes goes on and on of guys that I would just love to to be in the ring with because not only do you you know is it that match where you you know you're wrestling someone that you're an idol of, but at the same time every match that you're in you learn from the other person that's that's in the ring with you and to be in the ring with someone the quality of of a Bret Hart or Shawn Michaels or Chris Jericho and to walk away from that match with whatever knowledge that they give to you. Um, by the end is just uh, that would be something that I think would, would be beneficial to my career or would help me get to that next level. It's extremely ironic that you just mentioned Shawn Michaels too because now, now, that, now that you say that, it's really funny that you say that because you remind me a lot of Shawn Michaels in the aspect that you both have that rocker kind of gimmick, especially that you're still now. Your character kind of mirrors what his character used to be in the 90s when he was in the Intercontinental Championship picture. So that, uh, that works out perfectly, actually, when you just said that. And, uh, and then you just said Chris Jericho is, uh, what were you going to say? I'm sorry? Oh, never mind, sorry, I thought you were going to say something. But um, you mentioned Chris Jericho as one of your dream opponents. And now that Chris Jericho is back in wrestling, that brings 
my next question. Who would you? Who is your dream opponent that is on a WWE or TNA roster, or you know, just a day that you would like to face? On on the current rosters, I mean, obviously, you know, Jericho is the easy one because now he's back. But um, CM Punk is amazing in the ring. I love his work, and obviously, that'd be um, you know a, a great guy to face. But to be honest. Anyone that's in this business, their opponent that they should want to face that's on the current roster is is John Cena. I mean, he's the top guy. He's the guy you would make the most money with, and he's in the position that you want to be in. So there's only one way to get there, and that's to to be in the ring with him and and to uh, you know show everyone what you got when you're on the uh, in the ropes with the the very best. Exactly, because it, it says a lot about the match quality itself. Because as you said, CM Punk is the kind of person that you would want to get in the ring with that is going to deliver a five-star classic of you. Whereas someone like John Cena is someone, is someone that's going to really bring up the storytelling part of the match and really help get over as his big threat in the ring. So they're two really different superstars that can really do a lot of different things inside of the ring. So it's really interesting that you mentioned both of those guys. And um, I think that about does it for all my questions. Benny, you still on the line? Yes, I am. Um, and I'm not sure if you um, already answered this because I've been going through a couple of dead zones. Yet yeah, I've been still able to stay on the air because I'm driving to a console right now. But um, have you answered this question? What, what, who is um, the wrestler you at growing up when you started to get into wrestling that you really idolized or that? Um, yeah, what wrestler did you idolize? If you haven't already answered that question, oh, I did, but um, but again, you know, Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, you know, after that, and as the um, ECW era came, I loved Rob Van Dam, uh, Chris Jericho, and you know, as you as you move on to today, uh, I'm I'm a, I'm a fan of of most of the guys that are there. You know, CM Punk, I I think is is tremendous. And, um, you know, there's a reason why all those guys are on TV for one reason or another. Um, and I think you can take something from all of them and bring it into whatever you have to offer, bring it into your own. Yeah. Um, what, when, and this is actually kind of on the different end of the spectrum. It's about your personal life. And when you meet new people and they ask what you do for a living, how do people react when you tell them you're a professional wrestler? <laughs> That's you know what uh, out of all of the questions I've ever asked, that's probably one of the best ones because people <laughs> they act so different. It's 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 such a wide range of questions. You know, girls will be like, "Do you have meats and weigh-ins and and all that kind of stuff?" I'm like, it's not that kind of wrestling. And I have to be like, "You remember Hulk Hogan, the guy who used to rip his t-shirts?" Yeah, that kind of wrestling. Or you'd have people that just think you're the absolute, you know, abomination of the earth because for some reason, um, I don't know why, but wrestlers have that stigma to them where they're such bad people. Um, so you get judged that way, even though a lot of times it's just very unfairly. Or you get the, you know, the, the, the fan or the person that knows something about it or, or like, the, the closet fan that, um, you know, you tell them you're a wrestler and all of a sudden they start asking all these questions and, and you almost get a big smile on your face and you're like, oh, so you, you're a fan. You like, you know what you're talking about. But um, I think out of anything that I've ever told anyone that I was interested in or doing, um, pro wrestler definitely gets the most unique responses on, on all ends of the spectrum. Yeah, because it, it's kind of an odd Type of profession, like and you'll hear about this, and then like you'll hear about it, you'll see people on TV, and then um, you'll tell people you're a professional wrestler, but on the independent circuit. So, mm. Yeah, if you yeah. get asked, uh, oh, where are you on TV? And you have to try to explain to people the the deal and how how you get there. A lot of people don't get it. A lot of people, you know, kind of look at you funny. But you know, uh, to me. It, it doesn't matter because in my life and the decisions I've made, I probably wouldn't change for the world. Um, wrestling is what I want to do and what I want to do for the rest of my life. And if I'm doing everything I can 
uh, to make it my life, then, you know, I live with no regrets. Now, when you first started getting into the independent business, was there someone who was a veteran who kind of took you under their wing, or did you have to make it by yourself? Uh, well, there was there was definitely when I first started, you know, I started training under Spike Dudley, and, and he looked out for me a little bit. There was actually um, a wrestler that got me hooked up with training with Spike, and his name uh, is Ryan Waters. He's an independent wrestler throughout Massachusetts. Um, but then after that, uh, you know, I, I talked about Mike Bennett a lot, uh, and that's because he, he, I mean, he really did take me under his wing. We started riding together, and, um, you know, he's so phenomenal that uh, I would just sit there and, you know, have him critique my matches, and, you know, he taught me a lot. Um, and, and, and in general, um, you only get better by, you know, hearing those types of critiques and what you can work on. And I always try to ask people that are better than me, um, you know, how, how I can get better. And, and and after Mike, or even with Mike, you know, there I also rode with Tommaso Ciampa a lot and uh, Eddie Edwards a lot. And uh, same thing with both of them. You know, I was able to, to pick their brains and they were, you know, I, for whatever reason, you know, we've, I'm sorry? Uh, for whatever reason, we found a common ground, and, and uh, they seemed to like me too, so they, they looked out for me. And um, I was very fortunate and still am very fortunate to have such quality guys, um, you know, on my side. Yeah. Uh, hey, Graham, I got I just arrived, so I got to go. If you want to finish the interview, um, that'd be great. Thank you so much for coming on this show, Matt. Um, and Graham will just finish up the rest of the show, so I got to go. So. Thank Sounds you. Sounds good. All right, bye. Bye, man. Okay, so I just have one more random question. Um, my final right, question is the fact that um, on your tights it says it has your logo. It says, I believe, I'm not sure if it says Matt or just the M on it, but it has the MTV logo. Now, did you design <laughs> your tights? Did you come up with the idea for it, or uh, what's all that about? I, I did come up with it. Um, I had tossed and turned all these ideas and had um, have a, I have a good close personal friend that I, I grew up with that uh, is a web designer and a graphic designer that um, was coming up with a bunch of different stuff for me. And uh, one night I was just flipping through the channels and came across MTV and just kind of stared at it for a while and, and looked and was like, all those letters I could put my name in and... And so I called him up and told him the idea, and he thought it was great. And, and within a couple of hours, uh, that uh, Matt Taven MTV logo was born. And uh, it's been kind of a, like a trademark of mine ever since. Yeah, it's really funny because you have to have that kind of original logo kind of thing. And I'm not saying that's not original. It's actually really cool that you, that you incorporated that into your wrestling design because a lot of wrestlers just have those bland designs on their tights because I think – that plays a major role in your character because if you don't have some kind of gimmick, some kind of motivation to get the crowd behind you, it's just not going to work, and then you're just going to come off as a generic superstar. So that really just plays a role in, you know, getting the crowd behind you and having your own, you know, personification of who you are and your own character and gimmick and whatnot. No, definitely. I wanted something that uh, people would remember. I knew, you know, I started off where a lot of people wouldn't know who I was. So, uh give them something that they can remember. Oh, that was that, that guy with the MTV-like logo. Or, oh, that was that guy with, uh, you know, the big M on his, his tights. And, and granted, it's, you know, it is whatever. It's um, <laughs> But people remember it, you know what I mean? I've sold a lot of T-shirts with that logo on it. Oh, yeah, you guys sell merchandise? For your character or not? Yes, yes. All merchandise uh, you can inquire about at matthaven at google.com. Uh, shoot me an email. I have shirts on my Facebook. Actually, they show you the shirts on the Facebook. We're getting new colors of them, and uh, they come in all sizes. So if anyone has any inquiries about uh, merchandise, you can e send me an email right at matthaven at google, I mean at gmail, sorry, dot com. 
very interesting. Definitely look into that. I have a bold red T-shirt, so I really want to get one of your T-shirts too the next time in the NEW. So um, speaking of NEW, do you have any any information on the uh, next show that's coming down in Connecticut or no? Not in Connecticut, I'm sorry, just in general. Um, I I have been told that uh, you know we are returning in the spring. I believe March. There's a Poughkeepsie show at the Mid Hudson Civic Center, and I know April. There's a show, another show in New York. I haven't really been given all the details, but I do know uh, I'll probably be hearing more details, and more details will be announced on the uh, website and the Facebook page uh, probably shortly within the next month or so. Yeah, I thought you guys held the um, your WrestleMania like event for WrestleFest every January. Is that not happening this year? Or is it already happened? Um, well, I think they're going to move it to March. It used to be in March. Um, last year, I think, might have been the first or second year is in January. I can't really remember, but I think it's going to return in March as well. Yeah, yeah, because I remember, I think, it might have been in January, last year, I'm not too sure. Cause I think it was two years ago when you won the NEW title, I think, at WrestleFest. Is that correct? Yep, it was actually on my birthday, March 20th, so... Oh, really? Maybe, That's really cool. Yeah, so maybe last year was the uh, only year it was in January, and they're probably moving it back to March this year. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So uh, that about does it for the interview. Matt, thank you so much for coming on. I I apologize for the technical difficulties before, but it was really awesome having you on again in the, in the uh, exclusive slu- uh, I'm sorry, exclusive scoop on the Life of a Wrestler Star. I really appreciate it. Oh no! Thank you guys so much. Uh, you know, have me back anytime. It's very, it's very, very, very fun talking to you guys. Oh, thanks a lot. We appreciate that. And uh, do you have any Facebook or Twitter or anything you'd like to plug? Yeah, I got uh, Facebook.com slash Matt Taven and Twitter at the handle Matt Taven. Um, you know, hit me up on either one. Uh, I'm pretty good with responding back. Awesome, awesome. And uh, everyone else can follow me on save underscore us underscore GSM on Twitter. And thank you again, Matt. We really appreciate having you on. And hopefully we can have you on again in the future. And uh, hopefully, hopefully to see you soon next down uh, down the line in Northeast Wrestling. And uh, take care. Thanks a lot. And have a, thanks for coming on the show. You too, man. Thanks again. I'll, uh, I'll be talking to you soon.